Welcome to Module 1 of TECM 5200. This lecture introduces you to the overarching topic of the entire course. It's one of the required instructional materials for this first module and supports the work you're going to be assigned. I'll start by defining briefly digital content as it's understood within the world of content strategy. Second, I'll explain in some detail how content produces value in the world of business. Third, I'll explore the landscape within which business content exists. And fourth, I'll end by defining content strategy. Part one. Let's briefly focus on defining what people mean when they refer to digital content. Describing what counts as digital content is something that people who create content for a living understand better than most, but even these folks sometimes fail to grasp all the types of digital content their organization creates if it's not the type they create themselves. Here's a list of typical content types in a business provided by Kevin P. Nichols, author of the book Enterprise Content Strategy. Hang on. Annual reports, biographies, calendar or event listings, contact information, email, FAQs, forms, images, glossaries, infographics, instructions, legal disclaimers, maps, news items, blog posts, podcasts, press releases, product details, support or help content, user guides, user-generated content, tutorials, videos, white papers. Whew! That is a lot of content types. Now imagine how many of each of those content types a business might have published over the past year. What about 10 years? That's a lot of content. It's important for you to be aware people don't always mean the same thing when they refer to content. This is largely the result of the business unit or functional area where the people who create content about products work within a company. Let me try to explain. I'm showing you a simple version of something called the sales funnel. Traditionally, tech comp pros produce content that's delivered at the bottom of the funnel. In other words, after a buyer makes a purchase. That's when they need something like an installation guide for the company's software product. The Tech Comp Pro rarely works in their own business unit. Typically, they work in engineering or software development alongside the people who are designing and building the product. However, in order to get prospective buyers to enter the top of the funnel, companies need people to be aware of their product. That's why they produce marketing content, advertising, the creators of that content are usually in a marketing unit within the company. In the past, Techcom and Marcom writers rarely interacted. But way back in 2014, Scott Abel, known as the Content Wrangler, gave a presentation called The Future of Technical Communication is Marketing. He made a convincing case that customers are not well served by the separation of content inside a company. Abel said, I'm quoting, once a prospect buys a product or service, the content they interact with is no longer familiar. The instructions provided don't look, feel, or sound anything like the marketing and sales materials that introduce them to your brand. Neither does the service contract, the warranty, the customer support website, the product documentation, nor the training materials. Both TechCom and Marcom pros talk about content strategy. Sometimes they work more closely on content than in the past. I think ideally that would be the case. But they're usually talking about distinct types of content when they use the term content strategy. And they usually use different types of authoring tools or content management systems, CMSs, for their content. Component content management systems are rarely known outside of TechCom. As an aside, many people now focus on something called a customer journey rather than a sales funnel. We'll talk a little about customer journey maps later in the course, but none of that changes the points that I've made on this slide. Take a second to read one definition of content from Scott Abel. The quote comes from a 2014 book, The Language of Content Strategy. Here's another definition. This one comes from Nichols' Enterprise Content Strategy. 
Nichols has written a couple of books. Nichols specifically includes the word digital, but the reality is that most content assets in business are digital today. In his content experience consulting practice, he also includes items like product packaging and in-store displays. When I talk about content and content strategy in TECM 5200, I'll assume that we're primarily talking about digital content. I should also tell you, when I refer to sources in my lectures, you'll find a more complete reference listed in the To Learn More section at the bottom of each module's instructional materials page on Canvas. That's also where you'll find information about all of the various books that I use. They'll be in the Module 1 to Learn More section. So I want you to notice two things about content. It's more than text, and it's considered an asset to a business. I'll focus more on this second point in the second part of this lecture. Now that you know about all the types of content created within a business, in part two, we'll focus on its business value. The topic is so important to content strategy that Colleen Jones, CEO of Content Science and author of The Content Advantage, Clout 2.0, begins her book with that rather than with a definition of content strategy or even of content. If you're like most of my former students and pretty much all entry-level tech comm professionals in general, you lack the kind of business experience that helps you understand what counts as business value. This lack of knowledge is a perpetual issue for technical communication pros. In May of 2020, Tom Johnson, he's the host of the I'd Rather Be Writing website and podcast, earlier in 2020, he had a guest write a post titled, Why Are Tech Writers Often Treated as Such an Unimportant Part of a Company? The post was prompted by one of Tom's readers asking a question. It generated a lengthy and sometimes emotional discussion among readers. It's critical that all tech comm pros know something about business value in order to manage their own careers. I'm going to tackle that job right now. I'll explain a few basic business concepts, some of which I'm borrowing from a 2015 article published on Medium by a guy named Eric Jorgensen. To state the obvious, the purpose of business is economic. To create value through work, then sell or trade that value to customers, and finally keep some of the created value as profit. That sounds very abstract, so let's try a simple example. Isabella creates value by planting, weeding, watering, and otherwise tending to a range of vegetable plants. She harvests the vegetables, transports them to a market, and sells them to customers. Isabella's work produces value for her customers in the form of food. She keeps some of that value for herself in the form of a profit if she has money left after paying all the expenses for producing those vegetables. You know, the costs of land, seeds, water, tools, transportation, taxes, etc., etc. Of course, it's possible to reinvest all excess value or profit back into the business instead of keeping profits or paying them out. So this is what every nonprofit or public organization does with the business value they create. It's important to keep in mind 75% of all U.S. workers are employed in the private for-profit sector. So it's especially important to understand business value as profit. It's where most technical communicators are going to work. I've said that work produces value, which is traded for money. Of course, there's a little more to it than that. Sticking with the example of Isabella's simple and small business, here's another point I want to make. Because customers can choose vegetables from many different farmers, Isabella's business is likely to succeed in the long term only if she can offer unique value not available from her competitors. There are at least three ways we can think about this. These are all related to what's called unique value propositions. In the first way, Isabella's unique value proposition might be related to her expenses 
compared to her competitors. For instance, harvesting her own seeds instead of buying seeds means Isabella cuts expenses with the added work and makes her vegetables more valuable than those of competitors who have to buy seeds. She can pass some of that value on to her customers by selling vegetables at lower prices than competitors, or she can sell at the same price but keep more profit for herself. She's differentiated her business from her competitors' businesses. In the second way, Isabella's unique value proposition might be related to the quality of her vegetables. Using only organic seeds and fertilizer means she can sell to a smaller but significant segment of the customer market who prefer to purchase her vegetables because her competitors don't offer organic options. In the third way, Isabella's unique value proposition might be related to the quality of the experience customers have when buying her produce. Smiling at and greeting everyone who passes her in the market is a simple example of work that produces greater value, especially if Isabella's competitors are not very friendly. Isabella's friendliness is a business asset. It differentiates her business from her competitors. In this third category of customer experience as a unique value proposition, Isabella might create additional value by, for example, sharing recipes with potential customers using the vegetables she sells. The content she offered would differentiate her business even more from her competitors. Her content would create additional value. The recipes she knows and shares are therefore assets to her business. Now, instead of sharing that content in face-to-face -face interactions, Isabella could offer her recipes on printed index cards at the market so that she can share the content even if she's not personally present at the market. If Isabella created a template that reduced the time required for her to create recipe cards, she would create even more value. The work and expenses involved would represent an investment. For Isabella, that investment might be worthwhile if she can get enough in return value, or ROI. Colleen Jones, The Content Advantage, supplies a detailed list of content ROIs in her book. Larger and more complex businesses, especially those that sell complicated products or technology, have a history of using content to enhance the experience of their customers. They also have a history of creating and delivering content in innovative ways that lower expenses. If they manage content well, they realize a return on those investments. In Bailey and Urbina's 2012 book, Content Strategy, they have a chapter titled The ROI of Content Strategy. In that chapter, they recognize that for any business, profitability is the bottom line. There are two broad ways in which a business can become more profitable. They can make more money or they can spend less. I implied this just a minute or so ago and discussed three unique value propositions that could help Isabella compete against other vegetable growers through her business content. Here's the list Bailey and Urbana provide. A business can make more money by using content to build brand loyalty, to increase revenue, or extend the scope of their work. A business can spend less money by using content to shift the scope of their work, manage risk, or increase efficiency. We'll return to these ideas in a little more detail later in the course. I used Isabella's small vegetable business partly because I think it's simple to understand, but it also makes the point that most content is now delivered by non-traditional publishers. While producers of content were once traditional publishers, you know, news outlets, book or periodical publishers, Every business became a publisher with the internet, from software firms like Atlassian, to engineering firms like Floor, to non-tech firms like NFL football teams. Tech writers at firms like Atlassian traditionally worked on print documentation handed to their customers after a purchase to add business value to their technology products. But now they put that content online. Tech writers at companies like Floor have long created case studies to enhance the value of their engineering services. Those case studies used to be handed to potential customers in a print brochure by a sales rep. 
Now they're published on the firm's website, where anybody can view them whenever they want. As Sarah Kessler said back in 2014 in a Fast Company article, thanks to the internet, anyone can now publish content. In one of the chapters in The Content Advantage, Colleen Jones says, I quote, With the rise of digital, I'm convinced we have entered a new business era, the content era. So stories are often the best way to understand and remember something. Let's consider a case study published by Jones Company, Content Science, about a business called Precore. They design and build premium exercise equipment for gyms. Precore had two primary business challenges in 2015. Their first challenge was created by their success. They grew by selling more equipment, more than 50 new products in 2015. That meant more employees, many of whom were now creating technical and marketing content for all those new products. That resulted in important customer-facing documents that didn't always look like they were created by the same company. Precor's second challenge was that much of their growth was international. That meant the cost of translation for all of that content was out of control. Budget overruns, delayed, incomplete, potentially inaccurate content was released to their international customers. Precor's senior writer and content strategist, Teresa Gertz, got company management to allow the writing team to implement a rigorous editorial process. Precor implemented a create-edit-review cycle in the U.S. headquarters first and then presented two webinars globally to train everyone on the new process. Here's what Teresa had to say. The value that was created by a change in the writing and editing and content production process became a unique value proposition for Precor. It's interesting to note that Teresa also said the new content process trial changed mindsets and behaviors inside the company. This is a very important quote. A new editorial process helped the business achieve goals that had nothing to do with content. The moral of Precor's story is that their content became a more valuable business asset. The content creation process lowered the cost of translation, improved the customer experience, and increased profitability. That will get the attention of everyone in a business, not only those people whose job it is to create content. In November of 2020, I had the opportunity to interview Lucy Hyde, who's done content strategy for Amazon when they started out in the UK and later at eBay, and she's now a senior director of content at PayPal. Let's listen to Lucy talk about creating business value with content for a couple of minutes. How about an ending story? Um, maybe your one of the things you think was your biggest wins, like something you feel incredibly proud of having accomplished? Great question. Let me have a think. Yeah, I can share one relatively recent, actually, from about 18 months ago. So we had a situation... Um, whereby one of our flows, the conversion rate had significantly dropped off. So, you know, without sharing too many details, what we wanted people to do, they stopped doing. Um, and, and that was having a direct impact to our bottom line at a company level, actually, not just within a certain product or within a certain flow, but it was a, a source of revenue that for PayPal was incredibly important and high margin, high volume, global revenue. Um, when we dug into it a little bit, what we realized was that um, a legislative change had happened and the content had been updated. But when that happened, it was one of those kind of emergency things because something was passed and we weren't compliant. So we had to move quickly um, to become compliant. And the lawyers had written the content and they'd not had anybody from the content team included or the design team actually included in that process. Now, 
I use this one because it's really interesting because often content is seen as a cost center. And what I mean by that, you know, to your point around governance, that until it goes wrong, people don't understand why they need it. And this is a great example of why we really proved at a company level why it's important to have a content strategy and then to have people who are trained to write. Um, lawyers are trained to write legalese. They're not trained to write customer facing content and they've done a great job of protecting the company and meeting the legislative requirements but they'd broken the flow for customers um, and there was nothing explaining to customers why this product was a benefit or why they should use us rather than alternatives so we very quickly put a content strategy together rewrote the content did a small part of um, a small effort on redesigning the flows although the biggest change from sort of before and after was the words and we actually um saved well we regenerated if you like um over 10 million dollars in revenue that year um which yeah in one change and it was two or three people in, involved now we were lucky that we could quantify it because you know the downside of having a high visibility, high pressure project like that where things are going wrong is that they measure the impact you have. <laughs> you know, the company was very happy to put our analyst resource against it to, to see the difference once we change the content. So we were able to prove that on an annualized basis, we made, an, a, you know, more than $10 million worth of impact. And that, that amount can be the difference between hitting your results at year end and not for a company like PayPal, even multi-billion dollar companies, $10 million is significant. Um, now we don't get the chance to do that every day, obviously, you know, you, you might get one a year if that to do something like that. But I think it reminds us it built, not only did it have a great impact for that product and for that um, scenario, but it really gave the team a lot of exposure and I was able to build on that and use it as a use case internally and a case study to say this is why it's important to involve us. That is a super story. I love, I love hearing that. Showing that content has a direct impact measured in terms of money matters in every type of business. Before we move on to the next portion of the lecture, let me summarize what I most want you to remember about the business value of content. All successful businesses try to focus on work that produces value, which is then traded for money. When the work of content creators, like TechCom Pros, is tied to the creation of business value, they and their contributions are treated as more valuable. The challenge in most organizations is that no one, including content creators, knows how or is willing to communicate the business value of content for non-traditional publishers. I want you to get ready for that challenge. In the third part of this lecture, we'll explore the landscape within which business content exists so that we can build toward a definition of content strategy. Bear with me as I describe a little more about the people and processes within the landscape of content creation within a business. In part one of the lecture, I introduced the sales funnel to demonstrate that whether information is delivered to a potential customer before a sale in a print ad that was created by marketing copywriters or to a customer who's already purchased a product in a video tutorial created by tech writers, that information or content is something that should add value. It's a business asset. Let's think through a brief example of who creates content for customers or users and where that content is found using the example of a hypothetical software company. One product they develop and sell is it's a bundle of APIs for including weather information in a mobile app. Within this business, employees in marketing create a lot of content relevant to the weathery APIs. They write copy for ads in Google Docs, create visuals in Canva, create and deliver social media messages with Hootsuite, create and manage email campaigns with MailChimp, keep track of the editorial calendar in Google Sheets, publish web content in WordPress, and access Google Analytics for measures of the impact of their content. 
Over in design, UX pros create flowcharts representing the user journey in Whimsical. They create the mobile app interface in Sketch, working prototypes for testing in, in Vision, and visuals for presentations and reports in the Adobe Creative Suite. Over in Legal, employees produce customer-facing information using Microsoft Word. Over in development, software developers actually write some copy inside their PHP code for the people who actually use their APIs they sell. I haven't yet mentioned the tech writers in development who create API documentation in an XML content management system, and so on and so on. The bottom line is all of this content represents an, an ecosystem related to the weather APIs produced by the work of employees at the software company. Each piece of content should add business value. So a natural question is, who in the business is in charge of all of those content assets? The short answer is, in the majority of businesses, there is no centralized individual or job role who manages content. There's certainly no single way in which businesses are organized, but it's common in corporations across industries to have employees organized within business functional units, each of which has a chief officer as a senior executive who works directly with the chief executive officer or CEO making the big decisions about whatever direction the company is going to head. That group is called the C-suite. In the hypothetical software business I've been talking about, there's a COO, Chief Operating Officer, who supervises the work of the marketing and HR units. The VP of Marketing probably supervises the work of several units, maybe advertising, sales, could be customer support, but the visual only shows one level below the C-suite. The CFO, Chief Finance Officer, supervises the work of legal, accounting, and finance. Finally, the CTO, Chief Technology Officer, supervises the work of the design and development units. Tech writers report to a manager within the development business unit where software developers and QA testers also work. Legal experts report to a manager within the legal department. Advertising copywriters report to a manager within the marketing business unit. So the point I'm trying to make here is the people who create, deliver, or own the organization's content work in different business units and have different bosses who often have different priorities in their quest to manage their responsibilities within the business. Of course, the potential or actual customers who need weather APIs to do their own jobs don't care that all of these content creators work in different units of the business. If the software company can deliver weather API content that's produced or delivered more efficiently or that is more accurate, consistent, or usable than their competitors' content, then that content creates a unique value proposition. But there's no one individual or office responsible for making that happen. Instead, that's the job of a content strategist. Every content strategist believes content has a life cycle. It's created and goes through several phases and then finally dies, or more likely is archived. No two describe the life cycle the same way, however. That may be because the life cycles of content are in no way standard across different organizations or even different units in the same organization. So the one I'm going to show you is a generic one that I've cobbled together from many sources. Ideally, the content life cycle begins with a strategy. People at the software company think about requirements for their weather APIs, the goals they have related to the product, the budget, the schedule, etc., and then decide they need content of some kind, let's say some API documentation for customers, to fulfill their strategy. These people might come from development, design, marketing, or elsewhere within the organization. In the create phase, the tech writing manager and others do more specific planning and either acquire the content they need or create something original, or maybe even repurpose something that already exists. Maybe the company already sells a bundle of similar APIs and can reuse text and images they've already created. That documentation content is reviewed and approved by non-tech writing people. In the manage phase, the tech writing manager and others confirm they'll add new documentation to their web-based knowledge base. They determine the existing taxonomy and whether it's sufficient for the new documentation. They add keywords or metadata to the content to make it search friendly. 
In the deliver phase, someone uploads the new documentation to the knowledge base and completes the request to add customers of the new API bundle to the process for customer login requests. In the optimized phase, tech writers regularly review analytics to, to determine how well the new documentation is performing against goals set during the strategize phase. The tech writing manager reports on content performance to others across the organization. They'll make decisions to change metadata if the documentation needs to be improved or to archive the content once it's outdated. At the center of the life cycle, we have governance. We'll delay talking about this topic for the time being. Just think about this. Every content asset, every image used in advertising, Every topic file in a component content management system within a business is subject to the same life cycle considerations. You're going to see later how many content assets a business might need to manage. One way to get a glimpse of the landscape of business content is to look at job duties of content strategists. So let's look at a list of work tasks from a job ad for an entry-level content strategist that was posted in November of 2020 by a content strategy consultancy called Think Company, headquartered in Philadelphia. I won't spend a long time on individual tasks, but let's go through them briefly. The first task signals that content strategy is supposed to solve complex business problems. Second task shows that content strategy and UX design are closely related. And then third, doing content strategy involves collaborating with clients as well as both creative and technical teams of employees. Now we move on to more specific collaborative tasks. One of these involves gathering content from clients, users, and SMEs or subject matter experts. More specifically, content strategy involves creating some special deliverables like content inventories, audits, models, documentation, and finally, content strategy involves presenting information found in those deliverables to clients. I've shown some things in green here to indicate that they'll be a focus of your own activities in this course. In sum, the content strategist must work with many different groups of people across business units within the content ecosystem. Those groups do not have a singular purpose or goal, let alone a single boss. This is called stakeholder management. Somehow, the content strategist at our hypothetical software company must get all of these folks to agree about whether API content, if the firm's going to deliver content that's produced or delivered more efficiently, or that's more accurate, consistent, or usable than their competitors. While the content strategist certainly needs to know about how to handle content within its life cycle, he or she also needs to know about the specific goals and priorities of the stakeholders in different business units across the software firm. The landscape within which business content lives is critical to the work of content strategy. I've tried to show you that content is not a centralized asset. The content within an organization's content ecosystem is owned by many different groups. The consequence is that a content strategist must work with diverse sets of stakeholders to optimize the efficiency and effectiveness of content assets through their life cycle. Stakeholder management is a critical task for any content strategist. In the final part of this lecture, we'll finally get to a definition of content strategy. Because most businesses have to compete with others who provide the same product. They do. People who can carefully and creatively plan for unique value propositions are in high demand. These people specialize in what is called strategy, a topic studied by every business major everywhere in the world. Strategy for winning in any context, including business or poker or content, it's about formulating a plan and getting people to buy that plan. Let's think about what would go into a strategic plan for business content. In the book Enterprise Content Strategy, Nichols summarizes three functions of content strategy. Strategy related to content experience answers the question, how does the business define the content experience for those who consume it? And how do they determine what to create or which stories they should tell? Strategy related to content delivery answers the question, 
What processes does the business use to manage the life cycle of content assets? How is it created, reviewed, designed, marked with metadata, etc.? Strategy related to content governance answers the question, how does the business make decisions about content within its content ecosystem? Who are the people performing content strategy work? Had the pleasure of talking with Christina Halverson in November of 2020. Christina is the CEO of a content strategy consultancy called Brain Traffic, and author of one of the early and most cited books about content strategy. Christina clearly stated that most business folks think of people in marketing as the content people. Here's that quote. In part, this is probably due to the fact that every business has marketing employees, while not everyone has technical communication professionals. This might also be due to the fact that even in businesses with both, marketing employees are often more extroverted and therefore noticed more across the organization than tech writers are. Whatever the reason, it would be a mistake to assume everyone thinks of tech comm professionals first when thinking about content strategy. I want you to see a 2020 job ad for a technical writer from a company called PDS Tech, a staffing company. They listed these job duties. I'm not asking you to look at all of it. I've highlighted or put in bold all the places where content appears. Clearly, content is a central aspect of what it means to be a tech comm professional. In November of 2020, I also had the opportunity to interview Rahel Ann Bailey. She's the Chief Knowledge Officer at Scroll in the UK, a staffing agency specializing in digital content design and strategy. Rahel is also the author of one of the earliest books on content strategy. Let's listen as Rahel explains why tech comm professionals are generally better prepared for content strategy roles than others in organizations. So now, why do I say that being in tech comm gives you a good training to become a content strategist? I see so many content strategists who only know about the editorial side. And they think that they can operationalize their content by writing better, by copying and pasting faster, by using a spreadsheet. And they will, they will say things like, oh, we could use a spreadsheet to track this. And I'm thinking, no, 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 that is so old school. Um, they don't even know, like we know all their tools. We know about Word, we know about Google Docs, we know about Excel spreadsheets, we know about whatever, PowerPoint and InDesign. <coughs> they have no clue that help authoring systems even exist. They have no clue, even though it's existed for 30 years, is it 30 years, 20 years, something around there, 25 years, let's say. But they have no idea that it exists. They have no idea that component content management exists or the benefits it could bring or how much time it could save them. So my very first contract, maybe not my very first, but the first big one that I remember was with a helicopter company. They didn't manufacture helicopters. What they did was they bought helicopters and they had pilots. And the, the job of the pilots was to take people back and forth off of oil rigs in 29 countries. So their competitive advantage was we've never had an accident. In all the years of our operation, we've never had an accident. You can trust us, we're safe. We will get your people back and forth safely. <coughs> so what does that mean? They wanted to make sure that their safety documentation was impeccable. And they had this system because it was thousands of pages. Can you imagine you have 29 sets of procedures because you've got the overall procedure, but in this country, these are the um, everything from here are your statutory holidays to here's the procedure for maintenance people because in the tropics, it's one thing in a freezing cold country, it's something else, right? So you have to have variance. So 29 cents of variance. And they were trying to do it through Microsoft Word and master document and color coding. And it was an ex pilot and an ex aircraft mechanic whose job it was to maintain this. And they were on, both on the verge of quitting. And then someone came to my class and you know, they asked me to come in and speak. And I said, okay, 
I can see what you're doing and no, what you don't need is a better way to manage WordMaster documents. You need to do it this way. And when I showed them, they literally said, how soon can you start? Could you start like tomorrow? And I was like, well, no, <laughs> you can start maybe next week, but not tomorrow. But that's how, when they understood the benefits of it. But if I didn't know that, if I had come from a marketing background or a journalism background, I would have gone like, yeah, let's figure out a way to use Word better. So coming from the tech side means that you're probably using a lot of tools that nobody else knows about. And it's in, in some ways, it's like magic for them. My conclusion is that clearly content strategy is performed by technical communicators, even if not everyone recognizes that fact. Okay, so finally, drum roll. Let me simplify things for you by giving you a short definition. Content strategy simply focuses on managing a single business asset, content, when creating a plan to maximize value. Although most people situate content expertise with marketing professionals, a tech comm background is advantageous in content strategy because of our emphasis on techniques and tools for managing efficiency and effectiveness of content during its entire life cycle. Content strategy is not simple to understand, but I promise you'll have a solid grasp of what it is at the end of this course after doing some content strategy work.